This video is about why system level design is required in the design process. Now in modern complex systems, one of the crucial characteristics that they all possess is the existence of resource limitations. Typical resource limitations include limitations on processing speed and communication bandwidth, the need to contend for those limited resources, the limitations on available memory, and the fact that that memory requires differing access times, and in the area of power, limited energy available. And all of these limitations result in high system interdependence. And this system interdependence, along with the fact that these systems contain complex protocols, such as networking protocols, real-time or hard real-time operating system kernel calls, and communication protocols, these are among the primary causes of system unpredictability. And this unpredictability puts at risk the ability to design these systems according to the specification. Now consider the following design. The top of the design is the target architecture, which is composed of a CPU, an I.O. controller, a bus subsystem, such as these two buses connected by a bus bridge, and a second CPU and a DSP. At the bottom is the system functionality, what the system is supposed to do. And that functionality has been decomposed as a set of tasks, and these tasks are going to be mapped onto the target architecture, and the resulting simulation will uh, illustrate how well that merging uh, works. And the way that this happens is that the, when the simulation is running, the function mapped onto the target architecture uh, will take uh, various times, such as the software tasks will have differing latencies depending on how they're mapped. And of course, depending upon those things, such as contending for uh, available bus resources and processing resources and things like that. At the top, we have a histogram of the software latency according to the different applications that are running. And on the left-hand side, we have statistics on the uh, hardware architecture in terms of uh, you know, popular statistics such as how many entered and how many uh, exited from uh, each individual hardware element, what was the total delay, average delay, uh, those metrics uh, which are important to uh, evaluate such system performance. Now consider the following problem, a problem that we've come across with many of our clients. Suppose we have this target architecture and a set of software tasks that are mapped to the target architecture and consider that as version 1 of a product. And now it's time to develop version 2. And one of the things that you would like to do is to add functionality but minimize the amount of additional hardware that is needed to support that additional functionality. Now one way to do this, one way to accomplish this, is to over-engineer the solution. Let's just make something in the hardware faster. Could be making the uh, processors faster, the buses faster, uh, the DSP faster. Another possibility is to do or to perform rigorous studies in system level design to determine whether the changes that you've made in the target architecture will support additional functionality. Now one of the problems with over-engineering the solution is that you're never quite sure if the uh, result is going to meet your specification. For example, take the following graph. The graph illustrates the response time in two different systems. Uh, the first system considered to be uh, version 1 or um, version 1 of the product. And th the response times for that version is in red. And the specific uh, parameter that was investigated was having a bus speed, uh, let's say, of 200 megahertz. The over-engineered solution was one in which 
the bus speed was doubled. So the data in blue correspond to uh, the second version of the product in which it has been over-engineered by simply assigning double the clock rate for the, sec for the bus. You can see that the over-engineering of the solution is highly problematic because in the data that's circled, you see that the supposedly faster system actually results in response times that are greater than the first version of the system. And so this provides evidence for and the need to use system level design and system level simulation to confirm that the new system that you've created is going to meet your specification. And so the way that system level design is performed is on the left hand side simulations which would in this case be of version 2 would be run to determine the minimal changes needed for the hardware in order to support the additional functionality and to confirm that indeed uh, that system meets the uh, updated specification. And so running simulations and measuring in terms of uh, time-based metrics such as processor speed, memory storage, could be bus speed, a number of other time-based measurements, as well as power will give you an understanding of which uh, configuration is going to meet your specification. And if your system contains hard real-time tasks on the right-hand side, that, can all, that kind of analysis can also be included. And so bringing those together removes the risk of not having a system meeting your specification and enhances your ability to quickly converge to a design that meets your specification and uh, meets the desired costs. This ends the video on why system level design is required in the design process.